Hey there, YouTube. Brother Brooks here with a quick Bible study. Not Bible study, but something I saw on the news on Huffington Post today that I thought I should share with you since this is a ministry about exposing the works of darkness. Then it is my duty as a watchman to be able to see, look at everything in this entirety and judge righteously through the Word of God and reveal and expose it for what it is and teach you all so that you don't get deceived and be able to bring out others out of this type of deception if they are subject to it. I pray, Father, that you minister to anyone who is watching this video right now. I pray, Lord, that you may be able to use me and use your words to be able to speak to the heart of any viewers or anyone who may use the words that you have given me for another person that may be outside of this video who may who's watching it. I pray, Lord, that through the word of God, you may be able to shine a light on this deception, shine a light on everything that's being done, that true believers who worship the Lord in spirit and in truth may be able to understand the magnitude, depth, capacity, and tactic of Satan and all those angels and fallen, all those fallen angels and demonic spirits that worship him, that seek to steer us off the narrow path that you find. For Father, you sent your Son as the light in the world, that we may be able to walk on the narrow path that leads to righteousness and not the broad one that leads to destruction. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Please forgive me for any sins I've done today. And please embrace me with your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I just want to show you this all, read this article, let you see the video itself, and correlate that to Scripture, and you will see how blatantly wrong this is and how what's being done is simply an agenda and a plan to perpetuate a new religion, the new doctrine of theology, the new doctrine of spiritualism, the new doctrine of Christianity through feeling. In terms of what makes your body feel good, a feeling experience with God instead of a repentant experience with the Lord, instead of wanting to reject sin, you end up rejecting the truth. This, that, that is going to be the new religion, guys, that I'm seeing from my observation here. With the Pope Pius, when he receives the stigmata or the deadly wound that was healed, as uh, Revelation 13.9, and seeing stuff like this, from what I'm about to show you on the Huffington Post article, the new religion is going to be, and so many will be, be moved, because here's another thing. There are even some Christian churches that deem themselves having the Holy Spirit by running and dancing and jumping around. Only when the music is playing. But the Holy Spirit is one who convicts the heart to repent. Not dependent on if the band is playing or not, but the Holy Spirit has been so... There is a unholy spirit called a Kundalini spirit. I'm going to go to a whole other Bible study about that, but this ties into it. I'm just mentioned briefly, a Kundalini spirit is an unholy spirit that acts like the Holy Spirit. you got to understand, guys, the way Satan plays here. He has his counterfeit. As there is God, he has his counterfeit God. As there is Jesus, the Christ, you have your counterfeit Christ. And as there is the Holy Spirit, you have your unholy spirit portraying himself as him. Holy Spirit. So what do they do? They masquerade themselves behind music because they can't influence a human being to be able to move and control him as they want to outside of the Word of God. So what do they need to do is use something different. They can't use the Word of God to be able to move a human heart to get them to repent to Jesus Christ and ask them to forgive us of their sins and, uh, and accept them as their Lord and Savior. They can't do that. So what do these unclean spirits that portray themselves as the Holy Spirit, what do they do? They work behind music. They work behind music so they can get the body moving and so you have a feeling experience that you associate with God. That's the occult version of what's being done, or doctrine, the deceiving demonic doctrine that you're going to see here in this article, in this, in, in this video that you'll see briefly. But that's what these deceiving spirits do. They perpetuate God from a God of truth and, and righteousness and wanting to abstain from sin, when he explains to you what sin is, and he substitutes it with forgetting any of that and just feeling really good feeling really good having it, you, you associate your uh, you associate your relationship with the Lord or how good you feel in terms of in terms of an experience in some emotion something tangible 
But that's not the case at all, because then what happens when tribulation comes in effect? You end up losing that feeling for God, because everything's bad now. Because you have tribulation, you can't remember the remember the parable of the sower and the seed. Once the once the tears and the thorns and the cares of the world wrapped around it chokes the person. Well, there's a bad experience. So then, if your experience is only your relationship with the Lord is only as good as experience, and when the, when the tribulation comes, then where's your relationship with the Lord? Because it doesn't involve faith. That's why it doesn't work. It does not involve faith. But we, true believers who worship the Lord in spirit and the truth, we worship the Lord with faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. We believe through faith, not by sight. This new doctrine that Satan's going to come out with, that's going to move the world, especially Christians. It's going to move the world. And especially when that Pope, when Pope Pius gets a stigmata wound, what's going to really take the world and Christ, Christians by surprise it's the new doctrine of feelings, experiences, feeling something good, and attributing it to the Lord. That's what's going to that's what's going to happen. But the Holy Spirit works, and look through the scriptures, my friends. Take don't take my word for it. Look through the scriptures and look at the gospel. Everything that every person that came up to Jesus, the experience that they had through the Holy Spirit was a repenting heart, a contrite heart. A heart for forgiveness, yearning for the forgiveness of God, and wanting to reject and just be different and opposite of sin, and exalting ourselves as sinners and wanting to disyoke, to associate ourselves with that. That's the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. That was his whole message. He said he come for sinners to repent. He come for the sick. He's come for the unrighteous, not the righteous, right? So let's look at this video here and we're going to correlate this to scripture and you will be so amazed on how many people will believe it. Now, I'm sorry if the video doesn't play too good because I have a really really bad computer. Uh, I'm working with this what, I, what the Lord gave me to work with and I know my work is not in vain. So I just read this today and this was posted today. There's a guy called John of God, right? That's his name, John of God. And Oprah says, faith healer surgeries almost made her faint. Now read the article here. The article goes, John of God is a man with no medical degree and little formal education, yet the surgeries is an effort to help the sick and the dying. In the clip from an episode of Oprah's Next Challenge, which is she just keeps on and you know, has these episodes about different spiritualism, different uh, prophets or different mediums and spiritualists, you name it, and she just puts them in America's living room for people to try to, you know, salad bar, take whatever it is that they want that makes them that makes them feel convenient, that what makes them feel good. No, no, no. But here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's your way and there's the way of the Lord. And only one way gets you through that narrow gate, and that is Jesus Christ. So here with Oprah she has this show again that just lays out a litany of different options for you if you want to be interested in any other spiritualism, the convenient one. But going back to the article, it says John of God tells Oprah why he's able to cut into people's bodies and how it feels when he does it when he does so. Now check this out guys. An interpreter, John of God, says that a spiritual medium, his body oh, got my cursor in the way. A spiritual medium, his body incorporates the spirits of deceased healers. Now number one, the scripture says once you're in the grave, you're dead, you're asleep, there's no memory, there's no knowledge, there's no uh, there's, there's nothing in the grave. Everyone is just asleep until the day of the Lord, until he calls. So those were resurrected the day of, uh, some were resurrected to uh, condemnation, some were resurrected to life. But everyone is in the grave. The only people that's in heaven right now are those that God physically took out of here, like Enoch uh, took Moses' body. Archangel Michael took Moses' body. And I think Elisha, Elisha, Elisha was the one that was on the fiery chariot. And of course Jesus himself was resurrected and ascended to heaven. I mean, everyone else is sleeping. There's no memory. There's nothing going on in the grave. I'm going to do a whole Bible study to, to show you that everyone that's who's dead is sleep. I mean, everyone sleep and in the grave sleeping until the day of the Lord. If you don't believe me, look, read the gospel. Any parts of the gospel. Every person that Jesus met that's dead, he says, why are you crying? They're asleep. Why are you worried? They're asleep. Don't worry. They're asleep. Yes, he's dead. Lazarus is, let me tell you plainly, Lazarus is dead. But he's asleep. Now, if any of these people that Jesus had resurrected from the dead when they were plain and, plain and simple, they were simply dead, 
If any one of them were in heaven, certainly Jesus would have said one time, one time, oh, they're, they're with my Father, let me call them back. He never said that. They're asleep. The Spirit of God is His breath. The, the thing that enables us to become alive is His breath. Let me put it in layman's terms. If there's a robot and then there's a battery, and you put that battery in that robot, then the robot becomes alive, right? You take that same battery out of the robot, the robot is now off. It's not working. It's all, excuse me, it's offline. Now, we wouldn't dare say wherever the battery is, that is the robot too, right? Because this is the robot. The battery is wherever the battery is. The same applies to the breath of the Lord. The breath of the Lord is life. So if you look at the story of Lazarus, you see that when he says Lazarus come forth, his breath enabled Lazarus to have life. But where Lazarus was was his body at the present state of where was in the grave. So there's this big misconception has been so widely accepted that when you die you go to heaven. Then what's the point of coming back for our bodies? If, the, if Jesus says, if the, if the gospel says, if, um, the New Testament and the apostles write that he's going to come back from the dead and Christ will rise first. What do, you need, what do you need the body for if everyone is up there? If everyone's in heaven, why are you coming back for the body? Number two, if you look at the gospel, every person that Jesus resurrected from the dead never mentioned that they're in heaven. Not one. They're asleep. 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 Then you go to the resurrection of uh, those who are resurrected life and those who are resurrected condemnation. And you can go to Genesis, I think, 19, at the great white, throne, great white Throne Judgment, where everyone's going to get judged, and those who are who's in the Book of Life will have everlasting life. But that's the thing I'm trying to get you to comprehend. The idea that everyone, that people are dead, that somehow they're in heaven right now, is, is so, so parallel and so much associated to this idea here. That it, he would say this, the interpreter John of God said the spiritual realm in his body incorporates Spirits of deceased healers. So here we have a medium, a spiritualist, a sorcerer, who attributes his talent from people who are dead in their spirit. Simultaneously, some Christians actually believe that when you die, you're actually in heaven. That their spirit is up there. But that's not the truth. They're asleep. But yet there is a parallel to what he's saying to what Christians believe. Now, does that, now, how is that? can't be the same if they're totally different. So that must mean the doctrine must be different. The belief must be different. And that is, we're all asleep. They'll, they perpetuate and promote. No, you're, no, 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 you're not sleeping in the grave. You don't ever die. Remember Genesis? Remember the story that, remember what Satan told uh, Eve? That you will not surely die? It goes right with that. You won't surely die. Your, your, your spirit lives on. Really? Just show me where Jesus said your spirit lives on. It doesn't. I'm trying to get you to understand what we're dealing with, friends, in terms of spiritual deception. That's the whole point of this ministry. But let's continue on because this is supposed to be short, but I know how to ramble on. Uh, anyway, it says that healers who John, the, the healers whom John of God called entities are ones who perform the surgery, he says. So he not only has one, but many entities who possess him to do these miracles. And then he says, I kneel down on the earth and I thank God for the opportunity to be able to do this, says through an interpreter. I said, I hand over my body to God. According to John of God, while his body is incorporated by the Spirit, he conducts the surgeries or surgeries that are so raw they make overfill faint in watching them. And what I just witnessed um, almost made me pass out, she tells them. You weren't feeling faint, John of God responds, you were receiving a lot of energy that the entities were sending you. I felt like I was going to explode, Oprah says. I felt like it was so much heat and that I just was going to explode. See, I don't know why I try to emphasize like that. I don't, I don't think she talks like that. And I'm just being dramatic. Explode. Anyway, that's the power of God, he tells her. That's what happens to me when I incorporate the spirit. And so you see through their own testimony here, in conjunction with what Oprah is saying, they're, they're associating God through an experience, through a feeling, through a feeling experience, through something they can actually almost say is tangible. That is not the Lord.
the power of the Lord is getting a human heart to repent and turn from his wicked ways and associate his whole mind, heart, and spirit through love towards Jesus Christ in which he gives the Holy Spirit to be able to walk a narrow path that leads to righteousness because we set our eyes on him. And then as, a, as doing, in doing that, we then become righteous because we, and we accept Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of his Son that gives us grace. And that is through grace. We're justified through grace. And uh, here, this is just not the, 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 the case at all. This is just not the case at all. You know, and um, here we have faith. They, they, they have feelings. Feelings. And it's all temporary. It's all temporary. See? And, and the sad thing about it is that this is going to be the new doctrine, guys. So now, I just want to play you this video. It's lousy because I have a very terrible computer. And I don't have the money to buy another one. But I will not stop doing the Lord's work with what I have. But you've got to check this out. I hope it plays. When John of God entered the current room, he immediately started a physical surgery on a woman directly in front of me. When he came into the room and performed the first surgery, I was like, okay, I guess this is really going to happen. And then he asked me to stand up, and uh, I started to feel um, something. I didn't know if I was going to throw up or, like, have diarrhea or what. I mean, I thought, I don't know what's happening to my body. I thought, let me go sit down. And then I sat there trying to just put myself back in my body for a moment. The day before I arrived, Magnus, a married father of four, had come to the casa, all the way from Sweden. As he waited for his physical surgery, he had no idea his chest was about to be sliced open. Our cameras were allowed into the recovery room. I sat down with Magnus the day after his surgery. Is this your first time here? Yeah. First time. And why did you want to come here? Um, when I came here, I think the most of it was uh, my back. I was injured in my back, and I did four operations in two years. Mm -hmm. Suffering from chronic back pain, Magnus told me he took painkillers just to get through the day. He also says he drank heavily to ease his pain. Yeah. And so, what happened yesterday? Uh, I want to have a, an, a visible uh, operation. It's uh, very painful. It's painful now. No, nah, not now, but, but when the cut. It did hurt. Yeah, very well. Yeah. It did? Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've heard from so many people that it doesn't hurt, but it no, did for hurt. Me. What do you make of that, him being able to just cut you like, like that? It's uh, definitely think it's something spiritual, something like that. And uh, I feel the difference um, from yesterday, yeah, today. It's a lot more freedom. I feel. Um, not so heavy in my shoulders, and feels like uh, some new newborn. You feel newborn? Yeah, definitely. Can I see your scar? Yeah, if someone wants to rip, <laughs> rip it off. I just want to see where you were cut. Yeah. yeah. Right on my tattoo. Wow. Yeah. Yep, so there's a little blood coming out again. Yeah. And that doesn't hurt right now? No. What do you think you take from, from this place? I or a releasing, or... Yeah. I think it was for my, for my soul to accept myself. All the best to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Go, you should go clean up the blood. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go clean up the blood. Thank you very much. So, as you can see, guys, um, this is this is going to be well, not this verbatim, uh, but I'm just saying that this is going to be the new trend of spirituality that I'm observing here. It will be this association of, of what your body's going to experience, mutilation almost, borderline mutilation or borderline uh, euphoria, almost equivalent to sex, right? In that terms of euphoria or what drugs can give you, this high 
and this, this mutilation is going to be attributed to um, a spiritual experience. That that's that's what I'm observing here, uh, is the, and especially with Pi, uh, especially with Pope Francis uh, taking the name of a saint who experienced a stigmata from an angel that was crucified and they gave it to him. You know, it, it, this, this is what I'm seeing happening. Okay, and so we just saw what his followers, one of his followers just saying, notice the pyramid, notice the pyramid that you saw that they, ha that they all wear, even on this guy's shirt. And then go back to my Bible study about where that derives from. It's it derives from the seal of perfection of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but it's just one triangle, one tetrahedron of Satan wanting to be like God. That's all it is. It's Satan's symbol of him wanting to be like God. He doesn't want to be God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. He doesn't care about that. So if you go back to my Bible study, you see that that's the seal of perfection, and that's where it derives from, because it, there's a tetrahedron, and the tetrahedron is, uh, I just post the link up and you can check it out yourself about the seal of perfection, but that's where it comes from. It's a symbol reflecting God of what Satan said in Isaiah 14 that he wants to be like. And um, But now, let's listen to the the uh, leader of this. this um, what do you belief. say to your critics? Do you care about your critics who say that you are far but that what happens here is sleight of hand? He doesn't think it's He prays for them that they be well. No. How do you decide, how does an entity decide who gets surgery and who doesn't get surgery? How does the entity decide? The entity, that's the thing. He is possessed and he's doing these signs and wonders. The entity is to choose, not him. Against God's will. He is not a doctor. And so the entities tell you where to cut or where to place the instrument. He is asleep. He is not aware of it at all. They use his body. What happens is, he said, those the spirits that come are the good hearted doctors. As doctors are also missionaries of God. Everybody who leaves here, whether they have a surgery or not, says that um, they feel lighter, they feel happier, they feel somehow that they were able to release. Is there something that causes that? Yes, there is in this energy field. Yes, there is in this energy field. Because people believe that the kaja is the healing of the material one. It's also the, it's the treatment of the body and the spirit. How do we best shift our energy? Love. Some people come, but they're not ready to accept the eventual disincarnation of the body, leaving the body. We do not believe in death. We believe in God. You don't believe in Oh, notice what she said? So what he said? We don't believe in death. We believe in God. Hmm, where did we hear that before? Genesis chapter 3. When Satan told Eve, you will not surely die. When God says, oh, yes, you will. And believe me, he believes in God too. <laughs> but he believes you won't die. Or that's the lie he tells you. And it's the same thing. You guys heard it from his own mouth. But let's hear it again. And death. What happens when we die? Eternal life. You just drop the body. So, so a full corp, a key feature of work. Sitting out. As in, she died, she's probably. And where is heaven? In all the hearts of those who respect God are above all else. God is everywhere. And how do you define God? God is love. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and there's his following. You heard himself. God is love. 
And when you die, you just go to heaven. No consequence. Forget the, the, the great judgment. Ah, all that stuff you did. Ah, oh, his son coming to the cross. <clears throat> Get out of here. It doesn't mean anything. There is no death, by the way. Oh, and another thing. You want to know what the spirits really are? It's just energy. It's just unconscious energy that makes you feel good, puts you in this euphoria. Alright friends, let's get to some scripture here. Let's let's shine this light on here that is the word of God on this whole situation so that we can know the truth and not be deceived. And I, I tried to make this short guys. I, I honestly did. But uh you know, you know me. So here we go. So so far the scripture says that we are well here we go. Move this over here. This is what the scripture says on the topic of deception, right? It says that now in the la spirit expressly says that in the latter day, the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So we see this correlation with what the scriptures are talking about, and some are giving heed to deceiving and do deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The doctrine is that you won't surely die. The doctrine is that God is love and you know what, there is no judgment and there is no consequence. There is no being held accountable for everything we did and your name being written in the book of life and accepting Jesus or not accepting Jesus. That's the doctrine. And the deception is that you can have this relationship with God by feeling it with your body. That's totally nonsense. But let's go read more scriptures because um, I don't want to waste your time because I'm so grateful for having you participate and if you're still watching I'm even more grateful that you're sticking with me and the word of God and that we're able to fellowship here so here we go scripture says this in Matthew notice this friends how vital and how important which is why the Lord has put in my heart to do this ministry Matthew says now he Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying tell, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age and Jesus answered him and take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And if anyone says to you, look here, here is the Christ, and there, do not believe if false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and want us to deceive, if possible, even the elect. The point I'm trying to make out here is how important Jesus tries to emphasize to those who even know him and his followers to today is the importance of deception. It's very important to understand deception, which is why I'm here doing what I'm doing. I could be Steve, I could be doing this, I could be doing that, but I'm here to serve the Lord so that you, my brothers and sisters of Christ, can benefit from this. But it's very important to understand deception, folks. It's very important. Stuff like this is just going to get more outrageous. It's going to get more perverted and more uh, extreme in terms of trying to transform form the gospel of Jesus Christ into some experience your body's going to go through. That's not it. Anyway, here we go. This is what people who people of God are supposed to see God and not the occult, which is what I classify this through the word of God says. Bible goes, and when you say to, and when they say to you, seek those who are medium, because he just said he was a medium because the spirits come to him and that the entities take over his body. He's not where it was going on. As he said, he's the entities and the spirits. That's what he said. And seek those who are mediums and wizards whose whispers and mutter. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? Because he attributed everything he's doing to dead healers, deceased healers, who all have a good heart and, and they go to him and help do these surgeries. But God is saying, why would you seek advice from the dead among the living? That makes no sense. You know? Scripture goes on to say, uh, witchcraft calls for human sacrifice and provokes the Lord to anger. It calls on the under it calls it calls on the understanding of a God through a feeling experience. And the Bible goes, and they cause their son, here we are, and they cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying or fortune telling, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke them to anger. So here you see that these people cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and they practice witchcraft doing that. So the reason is, is because again there's this experience that is associated to witchcraft. It plays on the flesh because the flesh can be so easily manipulated to getting a person to believe because it does not require faith. What requires faith is absent of the body to be able to make the decision that you need to make to be able to be to worship the Lord of Spirit and the truth. 
But see, demons and the unclean spirits and Satan can't do that. They can't influence the heart through faith. So that comes from the Lord. So they have to use other means, which is the body and everything else that can manipulate it, like stuff like this, or music. And that's how they work. It's trying to move your body into some fancy experience that you can talk about. Instead of the renewing of your heart and watching yourself through the word of God and transforming of your mind, becoming more Christ-like. Here we go. Even parents were given with their children, as I just mentioned before, Second Kings, it says, And he made his son pass through the fire, practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft, consulted spirits and mediums, as this guy is one. And he did much evil inside the, the Lord, spoke both him to anger, and it says it again, that these caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the sons of Hinnon, who practiced soothsaying, used witchcraft and sorcery, and consulted mediums and the spiritualists, and he did much evil inside the, the Lord. So you see again this repetitious uh, expression of religion through witchcraft where people are sacrificing themselves or there's a self-mutilation associated or there's a there's an association to having some physical experience which is why people go to mediums, psychics and uh, you name it because they're trying to get an experience out of it uh, because they don't have to ever talk about sin being on the occult, being in the occult is the work of the flesh. The, body, the Bible goes, now the works of the flesh are manifest in these adultery, fornication, unclean, uncleanliness, uh, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variances, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies. And you see that one on this particular case that we're talking about, what's the work of the flesh is witchcraft. Witchcraft is associated to the works of the flesh. So when you see anything dealing with the, uh, a person becoming spiritual, or, or something that invokes the flesh, like drugs, uh, that is a form of witchcraft. Uh, ironically, if you didn't know, uh, the word ph pharmacy comes from the word pharmakia, which means sorcery. So as you have the word pharmacy associated with drugs, pharmacy comes from the Greek term pharmakia, and, uh, which means sorcery. Uh, first John says that a cult indulges and promotes and advocates three ways to sin. One of them, again, has to do with the flesh. The Bible goes, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it is not the Father, but it is of the world. So anything, everything that Satan uses to try to move the world into his plan, his agenda, his will, falls down to three filters. One, the lust of the flesh. The other, the lust of the eyes. The other, the pride of life. So in other words, Satan try to use what you see that, and to try to get you to do what you want, to do what he wants you to do. Or he'll try to use your flesh, to, whatever it is that you makes your body feel good, to try to do what he wants you to do. Or he'll try to get you to just blatantly, totally reject God and say, it's my life, I'll do what I want to do. That be the pride of life, that it's your life, to get you to do what he wants you to do. Those things you can fall, all sin filters through those three things right there. And then we have... <coughs> God does not approve the occult, and it says that there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire as he practices witchcraft, soothing, one who interprets omens or sorcerer. And you have God is clearly against the occult. He says, give no regard to mediums, again, familiar spirits, again, we see this with the video. Do not seek after them, and which we see people doing in this video. To be, do, uh, do not seek after them, to be defiled by them, I am the Lord your God. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. And a man or woman who is a medium or, or who has familiar spirits, and look at this, it's plural, more than one, shall surely be put to death, for they shall be stoned with stones, their blood shall be upon them. So the severity of de dealing with witchcraft back in the biblical times, the sentence, was, the sentence was death. The sentence was death, but we don't live in that time anymore. But yet the truth still applies to the severity of it. It's horrific in the eyes of the Lord. God will embrace us if we turn away from. Our, if God will embrace us if we turn our hearts from the cult. The Lord says, and Samuel spoke to the all the house of Israel, saying, "If you return to the Lord with all your heart, because that's what He wants, folks. He wants your heart, a broken and contrite heart that submits to the will of God in Jesus Christ and confessing Him as their Lord and Savior." Believing that Jesus has raised him from the dead, that is all your heart. When you, then you can love the Lord with your, all your mind, heart, mind, and spirit. But going back to the scriptures here, it says, to return to the Lord with your heart and to put away the foreign gods and the astroths from among you and prepare your heart for the Lord 
and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the land of the Philistines. So that's what the Lord wants. The Lord wants your heart. Now, how do you know who the Spirit serves? Because that's the whole trick here. How you figure this all out? Man, you can say God all you want, like this guy said. But that's not it. Here we go. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit where they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this spirit, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, is now in the world already. So the thing that he's saying here, it's not just saying Jesus Christ. I used to think that a while, time, uh, some time back. It was just Jesus Christ. But it's not just Jesus Christ. What the scripture is saying, anyone that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, Jesus Christ being the Son of God. God became in the flesh. He was incarnate in the flesh. He became, he, the Creator became part of His creation. It's acknowledging Jesus and His deity. That's what it's saying. Anyone who acknowledges Jesus Christ has come to this planet in the flesh. God has been made flesh for us to testify of the Father. Then you know that's a good guy right there. But if one just says, no, Jesus was just a prophet, or Jesus was just uh, an ascendant master, or Jesus was just one who was in tune with the, the, the tenth dimension, or he figured it out, he was in tune with his energy. <clears throat> or he had all the prophet spirits moving him. He was just a man. And that's what you notice with these occults, man. That's what you notice. What you'll notice this pattern from my studying of it. They like to bring Jesus as the Son of God who came to dwell with man. And they like to say that Jesus was not the Son of God who came to man. Jesus was the man who became a God. And it goes right back to where Satan told Adam and Eve that if you eat the fruit, you can be like God. It's the same thing he's been selling since the beginning. This is nothing new. And there's the most important thing I wanted to mention. I didn't put it up here, but I'll post it, <coughs> I'll post it for you. But the one thing that is also needs to be mentioned is where uh, the scripture, when Jesus says that when an unclean spirit leaves a man, it goes out and it comes back to bring seven more spirits worse than itself. So everyone who's getting cut and opening their mind is literally, literally letting themselves open for all this possession. They won't have a clue to why their life is all messed up. Because this person here, John of God, this person here is simply being used as a conduit to make room for seven more other spirits for each other person getting cut open. Because when one's there, seven, that one leaves, brings back seven more worse than itself for each one. That, then those ones leave, bring back seven more worse than itself. And that's how they work. Oh, and believe me, and here's another thing. As Revelation speaks that we, the Bride of Christ, get our... Are, are we are all in white with our new bodies, and we're down with the with the with the uh, the bright the light of the Lord, and, and wearing all white. Here they put it outwardly with their bodies. They put it as clothes. You know, put some white clothes on. And we're holy. We're righteous. You know, we're 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 divine. Like we're spiritual. Inwardly, they're not. The light is not in them. Like the light is in us, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. So, alright, that's all I want to mention, folks. I saw this here. I know I ran about, oh, I wish I could do shorter Bible studies, but this stuff is just mind-blowing sometimes. And I just have to warn you because that's my duty as a watchman. I see it. I bring the scripture out to shine a light on it. And then you can see it and we talk about it. In other words, I'm blowing the horn. So I love you guys. Um, go, go to the Huffington Post and you can see the article for yourself. And just type any of these keywords in. And you'll see it in the article yourself. And we'll go from there. I love you guys. Take care. God bless in Jesus' name. Oh, and leave me a message if you need to. Comment, thumbs up, thumbs down. Share, pray, and subscribe. Later.